Hey everyone, welcome back to the Questioning Behavior Podcast. As always, it's me, Mela, and I'm joined with my much better half, Sarah Bowen. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. And today we are also joined by an amazing guest who's written a book which will soon come out, although I'm pretty sure once this episode goes live, it has come out. So you have no excuse to not get this book and, you know, just dive into the science of influence. Of course, I'm talking about the amazing Zoe Chance. Zoe, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for that fabulously friendly introduction, (laughs) Bella. Did you expect a not so friendly introduction? What kind of podcast have you been on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've talked with you on the phone before and you were hilarious and sarcastic. Thanks. So who knows what to expect? That is a very <laughs> fair point. I can just see Sarah's face just nodding, just going like, yeah, it's a, it's a wild ride with this one. But to kick us off, we always ask our guest this. Zoe, could you please tell the crowd, who are you? What do you do? And how did you get there? Sure. My name is Zoe Chance, and I'm a professor at Yale School of Management. And I teach a class here that's called Mastering Influence and Persuasion. The students sometimes call it doing uncomfortable things that make you a better person. And and this is, (laughs) it's the most popular class at the business school. I love teaching it. It's what I've been putting my heart and soul into for the past decade. And I wrote this book that's just coming out called Influence is Your Superpower. Mm -hmm. The science of winning hearts, sparking change, and making good things happen. And this came out of the material that I teach in this course, but it's also chock full going deeper into the science with more strategies and stories and fun, practical stuff. So I wanted people to be able to have a chance to get some of these ideas and tools without having to go to a place like Yale. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I would love to go to Yale. I don't think my desire to go to Yale is necessarily the issue. I think for a lot of people, wanting to go to Yale is not necessarily the issue. But I can imagine that, you know, just manifesting in the US and then hopefully getting into your class, that's not the best economies of scale. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But congratulations on writing the book. What a huge achievement. And for thank you for being here to talk to us about it and about influence. And I mean, my first question, whenever, I don't know, maybe maybe it's because I'm a scientist or an academic, I always want to try and define things and put things in a box, make sure we're all (laughs) on the same page. So influence, what is influence to you? How do you define it when you teach and in your book? It's it's important, right? (laughs) Because there are a lot of different ways that you could define it. And I just define it very simply as affecting change in someone's thoughts or behavior. Okay. okay. And that someone could be yourself or is it definitely yeah. other oriented? Yeah, it could be yourself. It could okay. be other people. And and the course that I teach mastering influence and persuasion, persuasion is a subset of influence mm-hmm. and it's influence through various means of communication. I see. I see. Okay. That's interesting. I always don't know why I would think persuasion is more directed influence, but... Yeah, no, that makes a bit more sense. Okay. I I think that's true too, right? Because communication is intentionally directed influence. Mm. I just didn't mention that part. No. Okay, cool. And you you could have directed influence that's not communication as well. And now we're getting super nerdy and I love love talking with fellow nerds. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We could probably talk about definitions for days (laughs) in loops and circles, but... um, Absolutely. We can talk, go into the Latin, derivation, influere, to flow in. Talk dirty to me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Talking about doing uncomfortable things. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That that was a really interesting way of describing being in your class, like Mm -hmm. learning how to do uncomfortable. What, What is it about influence that makes it uncomfortable? Do you find it uncomfortable, Sarah? I, I, it always has to depend on the context, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe there is a sense, I mean, as behavioral scientists, we're talking about, you know, we have a responsibility where, you know, you can change choice architecture, you know, it's going to, it's, it's not neutral, it's going to influence something. And there's a sense of responsibility and information asymmetry. And I think that 
it can be uncomfortable if someone doesn't know they're being influenced. If you feel like you're being manipulative. Yeah, right? that's it. That's Yeah, because you have good intentions. You don't you would like to influence people, but you don't want to manipulate them. How about um when you're advocating on your own behalf, like say asking for money? Is that uncomfortable? Or do you Oh, you're you're uncomfortable? asking a British person. That's the wrong yeah. person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, again, surely it depends on the context who you're advocating towards. A stranger? I mean, most interactions with strangers I would find uncomfortable. Is that because I'm British? Just period. It's, it's yeah. because you're British. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, f- what what about for you, Zoe? Do you do you define like feel as though influence is uncomfortable innately? Or no, no, okay, no, and I, I she, think she that wrote you don't the book on it. <laughs> but no, I, so I, when I was growing up, I was not just uncomfortable with influence, but kind of uncomfortable with people and oh. with life. I was so shy and I was so nerdy that my theory was that the reason people talked over me and didn't listen when I spoke is that my voice was the same exact timbre as the ambient sounds of the universe so oh. that gives you an idea of how nerdy I was oh yeah <laughs> right and and I started doing theater because there was an opportunity to audition for a show where everyone was guaranteed a speaking role and I figured people have to listen to you when you're on stage and you're speaking the show sure. was Aladdin I was cast mm-hmm. as cobbler number three mm-hmm. and my one line was shoes for sale <laughs> uh, it wasn't uh, a shining moment in my <laughs> life. But I I was so bad at communication and so terribly uninfluential that I had to try really hard mm-hmm. as a kid and then study it really hard as an adult because it, it just didn't come naturally. But that helped me understand what it takes. Mm-hmm. And I think there are plenty of people for whom it comes more naturally, but they might not be the best teachers mm-hmm. because they don't know why the thing that they do works. Interesting. Most most people do find influence uncomfortable. And like you said, Sarah, depending on the situation, I've taught. So I teach lots of leaders in lots of different roles, but including nonprofit leaders, world famous artists, Olympians, nope. CEOs central bankers, princesses, all these incredible leaders come through my class. And I'm supposed to be teaching them leadership, which is kind of hilarious. But I learn a lot from them as well. But what I find is that all of just about everyone I've ever taught is uncomfortable with influence in some domain of their life. So I was talking with this incredible woman who's a Cuban artist who has she's world famous in her field and she had gone to jail multiple times for her That's art. Different. She's yeah and she's so committed to her cause she's a political performance artist that even when hundreds of artists curators people in the art world around the world people like the curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art mm-hmm. had signed a petition to get her freed from jail and for political reasons they decided to free her and she said I'm not leaving unless you free all the other political prisoners who are in here with me this is how strong she is and how comfortable she is with her own influence and her own voice but she was telling me by the way her name is Tanya Bruguera okay. Tanya Bruguera is absolutely amazing she was telling me that she feels her throat close up when she has to advocate for herself on her own behalf. And in particular, when she's asking for money, which you have to do as an artist. I've it talked comes with, with the territory, I'm afraid. Right? Yeah, I've talked with CEOs who run Fortune 100, 100 companies who mm. are uncomfortable telling their daughter to clean up her room. <laughs> I've <laughs> talked with Wall Street bankers who are aggressive in the business that they do, but they don't feel comfortable trying to get the attention of a busy bartender. And politicians mm. who are so uncomfortable dialing for dollars that even though they love politics and they love voters and talking with people, working with people, they quit politics altogether because they didn't like the fundraising is there within all of those domains that you've uh, noticed from you know you're you're teaching your class is there a specific domain which is very often the most uncomfortable or that most people 
most frequently seem the most uncomfortable with? Money is the most uncomfortable and love is the second most uncomfortable. Oh. Particularly for women, but also for men. There and so I think it's it's maybe equally uncomfortable for both genders, but or all genders, mm. but men have been traditionally socialized to be the ones who ask. Mm, and sure. so they even if they're super uncomfortable, they do it more, or at least they understand that they have to do it. Mm-hmm. And women have been traditionally socialized to think that they don't need to do anything except maybe the Disney princess thing of like, you just fall asleep and (laughs) wait for your prince to come and kiss you and then wake you up and you live happily ever after. Very passive. Mm. Yeah. So women are especially, especially uncomfortable with the idea that they would have to do something to influence someone to potentially be their partner. Fair enough. So as the genders have been uh, differently socialized, are there also different, I wouldn't want to say remedies because it's not exactly an illness, but are there different approaches to teach them how to actually exert their influence or how to become influential? Or is that not that different? It the I'm pausing because the remedies are very much the same. Mm -hmm. but they differ in how important they are. In the book, I have a whole chapter on negotiating for women Mm -hmm. because it's called Negotiating While Female. And there's been a lot of research on gender differences and negotiations. The remedies are the same. And the main thing is that we need to lead with warmth. Mm -hmm. The two, you know, you guys know already and many of your listeners will, but the two dimensions of social judgment are fundamentally warmth and competence. What a lot of people don't know, though, is that warmth judgments happen quicker than competence judgments, and they're stickier, and they're far more powerful and persuasive. So when we're talking about influence, warmth matters much more than competence. Whether somebody likes you matters much more than whether they respect you. And if they like you, they're going to try to find a way to do the thing or make it happen. They hope that it will work out, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't like you, it just doesn't matter how competent you are. They want nothing to do with you. So women get judged much more harshly than men do on this dimension. Mm -hmm. But men and women both do better when they're warmer and they're better liked. And you can probably think of exceptions. All of us can think of exceptions, but in mm-hmm. general, it's a terrible idea to try to have your strategy be, I'm going to be one of those exceptions and I'm going to be an absolute jerk because I've seen some jerks get ahead. <laughs> but <laughs> ironically, ironically, the people that come to mind who score very low on warmth and very high on perceived competence, and I say that like that for <laughs> a reason, are all men. I can't yes. actually come up with with a, a female example or a non-male example. Um, and I'm really, really trying hard right now. And I just can't. So clearly this strategy does have some benefit for men or at least a lot less of a detriment. I think the yeah. latter is probably a better way of phrasing it. Yeah. yeah. And even if your listeners can come up with an example or two, absolutely, you're right. Almost all of these people are men. Mm. and lovely (laughs) i guess it just reflects that we hold men and women to different standards across all domains including influence you know and what is judged to be warm or competent there is you know implicitly gender plays a role into our into our judgments would you say yes absolutely and it sucks for women it just really sucks and When one of the things that's important for any of us who care about it, whether we're women, men, whatever gender we are, is that we do the best that we can to organize our behavior systematically. So Mm -hmm. that, for example, if someone, so men are more frequently advocating for themselves than women are. Mm -hmm. And so if we have men and women transgender people, whoever we have working for us, if somebody comes and one of our employees asks us for some exception or benefit that we consider granting that 
to the other people who work for us who didn't think to ask or were afraid to ask or didn't mm -hmm. imagine that it was possible. Because if we don't do that, then we're just letting privilege flow back to the privileged. Right. Sure. Yeah. A no. small example of that is um, just this year, COVID is crazy. Everybody's mm -hmm. having a hard time. I mm -hmm. had five TAs working for me and one of them was getting behind on the work that they needed to do for class. Mm -hmm. And if I weren't thinking about this kind of thing, then I would have just let that person have some extra time for that week and asked the other TAs to cover for them. Mm -hmm. And instead I said, okay, equity, what would that look like? And I just gave all the TAs a week off from coming to class so that everybody could get caught up on, if it wasn't the work for my class, then it was something else yeah. in sure. their life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is, I guess, like uh, comparable to, you know, the, the wage gap as well. It's sort of men advocating for pay rises and sort of you're, you're saying, if I interpret it correctly, that you should only really be offering a pay rise to the person who, who comes and asks you for it, if you can offer that same pay rise to the equally competent people on your team and do it automatically. Essentially, yeah. Mm. Yeah. My colleague, um, Barbara Biasi, has a recent study where she was looking at pay among teachers in Wisconsin, American state, where they had been unionized and the wages were set by according mm -hmm. to the tenure. Mm. And then they... I don't know if they de-unionized or if they just changed the system so that you were allowed to advocate for yourself and ask for pay raises. Mm -hmm. When that happened, up until that point, there had been no gender wage gap. And mm -hmm. starting from that point, each year, the gender wage gap grew by, I think mm -hmm. it was 1% because men started asking yeah. for raises. And it, it's not, it's really not actually about gender it's really about power and privilege but gender mm -hmm. is one of the ways that that shows up yeah there was another large study that happened to be related to schools as well but there's a sociologist who's fantastic named jessica Calerco, and she did a, a long embedded uh, qualitative research study in an elementary i think it was an elementary school i'll have to look and see if it's junior high but she was T noting down which students were advocating for themselves, which students mm -hmm. were asking teachers for extra help or extensions or flexibility or to get out of punishments. And mm -hmm. she, was look she was comparing working class students to middle class students, mm -hmm. students from those families. And what she found was that middle students from middle class families were asking seven times as often <laughs> as students from working class families. It's... Wow it's shocking that the gap is so big, right? You're not surprised about the direction, but the magnitude is, is shocking. Huge. Yeah. And she was interviewing teachers and interviewing parents, by the way, she looked at whether teachers were also prejudiced and they weren't, they were equally likely to say yes to a request from any student. They were basically trying to say yes to everybody. They're teachers. They, they're nice. And they also just don't want to be hassled. They nope. just want to like, take yeah. care of it and move on. And when she interviewed the parents, she found that parents of the middle class kids were teaching their kids that privilege is negotiated. And parents, working class parents were teaching their kids that success comes from self-reliance and determination and you have to work hard and you have to prove yourself it's really unfortunate that yeah. that mindset and mentality of work hard and prove yourself is not the most successful one and i grew up in a poor family single mom and so those kinds of differences strike me at my core and i'm especially committed to helping people who didn't grow up privileged to get the kinds of tools, teachings, learnings, and then actual science beyond what the privileged people's parents might have taught them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you said, I'm not remotely perplexed by the direction of this result, but yeah, the difference is is huge. So we've now already discussed uh, the influence of gender, and this is now also the influence of socioeconomic status, uh, which uh, of course massively overlaps with race. So is there, th these three I find 
not super surprising that they have um, a direct impact or link with how one is perceived and how one is influential or could potentially be influential. Is there another factor that is maybe a bit more surprising that you found had a massive impact on how influential you can be or that you need to uh, adopt a slightly different approach than what people are currently doing or what is known to not work? I, I think the most important thing here is that it's not that different types of people need to adopt different kinds of strategies. Mm -hmm. So many studies, for example, have shown that women, when they're negotiating, when they set targets as high as men do, they make as much mm -hmm. money as men do. Oh. So it's, it's not that we need to be doing something differently than they do. It's that we need to be doing something differently than we are already doing. Sure. And the same with the class gap. Mm -hmm. And I assume and have had many conversations with people about race differences. There's really not a lot of research looking at um, these kinds of studies and race differences, mm -hmm. but it's because it all ties in with privilege. Mm -hmm. I think it's very rational to assume that these go in the same direction. So people who are comfortable advocating for themselves do a lot better than people who aren't comfortable advocating for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is partly why my course is called doing uncomfortable things and that make mm -hmm. you a better person. <laughs> yes. Because we tend to just all of us stay in our comfort zone, right? So in the class, we, t we do a series of weekly challenges. Every week you're doing real world challenges and a bunch of them happen to be uncomfortable. It, that's not the, uh, primary goal. <laughs> That's the secondary <laughs> goal. But as you keep practicing stepping out of your comfort zone, you're expanding your comfort zone. Mm. And part of the idea of writing this book and shifting the paradigm for how we talk about influence is to give people the idea of influence as potentially being a process of self-development. Mm. And although I teach lots of tools and people are excited about tools, what happens when you practice tools over and over and over is that they become comfortable enough that you're not thinking about them. And then eventually you're really not using a lot of tools. So the tools are not the answer. They're not the destination. They're only the path to getting there, becoming a person that people want to say yes to. Mm. So that mm. path feels uncomfortable. And you can think of it as like the path to, at least as an adult, learning a second language or a third language or whatever number you're on. No, it, let's not talk it, about that. It, <laughs> so it's conscious and it's awkward and you have to think about it before you speak and you're not relating to people in this just simply, comfortably authentic way while you're learning that language. And then when you get enough comfort and practice with it, you don't have to think about it anymore. And it just flows. And this is what influence is like as well. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a similar paradigm shift from sort of the fix to the growth mindset. You know, influence is something that is teachable, you can learn how to do it, you can practice it, and it can become natural. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, yeah. really interesting. And now, and se secretly, Zoe is not even working here with a growth mindset. She just started this entire class with this super uncomfortable challenge just to have a good laugh. That's what this all is about. <laughs> oh, my God. We have so many good laughs. That is a huge motivation. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. One of my favorite challenges had... It was nothing that I assigned. It was just a student who loved doing the challenges. And a lot of students just start having fun stepping out of their comfort zone and just practicing that. Yeah. And, and this guy, so he, you, you picture a weightlifter mixed martial arts, huge dude. He also happens to be really nice and he's a ballet dancer, but when you see him, he, he just looks like a, a football player, or rugby, not American football or rugby player. And he had an, a neighbor he'd never met and she's seven years old and she's having a birthday party and they have this giant bouncy house in the backyard. <laughs> He's never talked to her parents and he mm -hmm. just goes into her yard and he crashes the seven-year-old's birthday party by just getting in line for the bouncy house. And so he 
<laughs> the, and the people running the bouncy house, I guess, like think he belongs and he goes through the bouncy house. And then <laughs> he talks to the girl, he talks to her parents and they end up becoming friends. He graduated that year, but they invited him back to New Haven every year after that for at least three years for this girl's birthday party. So he went to her eighth birthday party, her ninth birthday party, her tenth birthday party. And it's just an example of how people tend to be so much nicer and so much more welcoming and willing than we expect that they're going to be. But we don't know that until we start testing that. Oh, that that's... is some serious dedication to a bouncy house. That's I mean... so wholesome. <laughs> so wholesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to pick up on something you said a bit earlier Um to probe a little bit deeper into this idea that we tend to be more comfortable when we're not advocating on behalf of ourselves. So if we're practicing influence at work or on behalf of someone else, on behalf of a cause, that appears to sort of become come a little bit more naturally to people then when it comes to, uh, you know, advocating for themselves or, you know, doing it for themselves. What can explain can you help me understand why do we have this uh sort of uh, uncomfortableness or tension between these two things i guess a lot of this comes from the training that we get from our parents and girls do get more of this than boys but kids are great at advocating for themselves right all kids they're, they want stuff, they learn to say please, and they don't take no for an answer, and they keep advocating. Almost every single child, doesn't matter if they're shy, because influence is the only means of survival that a child has. Mm, and, sure. But our parents and our teachers are teaching us and training us that we need to be good, we need to sit back, we need to develop what this executive coach I love called Tara Moore calls good student habits. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is that we just need to do good work and we turn it in. And if we're good enough, then the teacher gives us an A, but then mm -hmm. we're trying to carry these habits into the workplace where we're, we're not supposed to take up too much airtime. Right. And mm -hmm. we're not, we're, we're just taught that we're not supposed to be selfish and we're supposed to be generous. And there's nothing that's bad about that. It's very sweet, but we're not comfortable doing something that feels selfish and we're comfortable doing things that feel generous. And you know that humans as a social species are wired for generosity and we get dopamine hits from generosity. We don't get the same kind of dopamine hit from some selfish act. Mm, I see. Interesting. And well, I mean, I guess it comes down to the definition of selfish as well. I mean, right, we all, absolutely, we, and and it, it's such a negative word, like to say, you know, to do something for your own benefit. But yeah, it doesn't always have to be the case. Is that part of a sort of a retraining, a rewiring our brains? Um, yeah, yeah, we need to. Yeah, know. and and you can do sort of an Aikido move on yourself. <laughs> if you train yourself or remind yourself that when you are role modeling, advocating for yourself, having boundaries, taking care of yourself, this is a service to other people. Mm. It's And it's not just a service to people who look at you and see, oh, look at Mela, look at Sarah. She's the kind of way I want to be. But even in that moment, like say you're, and of course you're role models for other people. Mm. I hope not. Even, it, <laughs> it's dangerous, but uh. uh, even in that moment and in saying no is a domain where people are particularly uncomfortable, right? Mm. And again, this is particularly true for women, but not just women. When we get comfortable saying no, we help other people be more comfortable saying no. And when we don't get weird about saying no and the idea of saying no, and when we give other people space, to say no to us, then our requests use that cringy edge of neediness that is repulsive to other people. <laughs> so is it selfish to say no and model good boundaries? I don't think it's selfish at all. Is it selfish to 
acknowledge that you absolutely need to take care of yourself before you could take care of other people, you know, the whole oxygen mask metaphor yeah. and all that. But I'm a huge believer and not just believer, but just acknowledger of the truth that you have to keep your cup full or there is nothing for anybody else. Yeah. So if you are a visionary, if you're a leader of people in any possible way, if you want to do big, great stuff, there's no path to success that doesn't include boundaries and advocating for yourself to be able to have the energy, the bandwidth and the help and the resources that you need to be able to get there. Mm, absolutely. And and as RuPaul always says, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love anybody else? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, to that's sort of what you hear, you know, in a therapist office about, you know, why can't I maintain good relationships with other people? Well, start with yourself. Um, yeah. So get some boundaries. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so it's 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 a reframing challenge, I guess. Yeah, of, of and our actions. Yeah. When we start this boot camp class, the first uncomfortable thing that you do is say no for twenty four hours, and you say it's the no challenge, and you say no to absolutely everyone, absolutely everything, and with the caveat, like, of course. If your sweetie proposes to you and you want to marry them, or if you get a Thanks. call and they're <laughs> offering your dream job, like you're not like, yeah, no, ask me tomorrow. But so <laughs> taking care of yourself and your life, not ruining your life to just practice what it feels like to say no. And what you find is that actually other people are far more fine with it than you expected. Mm. Because we, when somebody's asking us for something, we're focused on how difficult it would be to say no, how uncomfortable that is. But when they're asking, they're thinking about how difficult it would be for us to say yes. So their probability of us saying that yes wasn't even close to 100% no. unless it's a very close relationship and the thing that they're asking for is small. But this also helps us start to disentangle the content from the style mm -hmm. and what you're asking for saying yes to or saying no to from how you ask or how you draw that boundary. And there's a whole style that is really underused and underappreciated, which is the warm, enthusiastic no. So <laughs> instead of just like, oh, gosh, oh, you know, I really wish that I could, but I have been making all of these excuses, just mm -hmm. saying something like, oh, my God, absolutely. No, that sounds horrible. I would rather <laughs> die. <laughs> I would rather die. I, you know, I love you, but definitely no. There's when you hear somebody talk like that, it's it's funny and it's sweet, and you don't you can't get mad at them, right? They're just authentically sharing their feelings, and you. Feel I mean, it really depends they what like they're you. asking. <laughs> I, I feel like there's some types of ask, even if you say no enthusiastically, you're not gonna get away with it. <laughs> okay, like if. Uh, you're at the table and somebody asks you to pass the salt and you're like, oh my God, no, no, <laughs> no, they just Maybe think not. that you're crazy, right? Yeah. But I guess, crazy. you know, if someone's like, oh, you know, I, I know it's a bit uh, short notice, but like I have to move house this weekend. Can you please help me? I don't know move my bed and my 600 house plans i'd be like mm. i mean i'd probably say yes anyway because you know if a friend asks <laughs> why not but enthusiastically saying no to that being like no that's I'd exactly rather... that's exactly the kind of situation i'm talking about mm. where you go like oh my god i love you and i would do almost anything for you but not that. carrying heavy things makes me grouchy beyond belief i would hate you after that day and i love you and i don't want to hate you yeah yeah and, and maybe you need to practice saying no Mella more often yeah clearly because it, it says everything about me that I wouldn't even consider saying no I just look in the diary and be like I have availability between 12 and 3 in the afternoon I will see you then <laughs> <laughs> but, that, yeah. and that's how nice people are right that's how nice people are because we default to saying yes so so I do challenge you if you're up for it and any listeners who are up for it to try the 24 hour no challenge and see how it goes because you can think about it, hypothesize, postulate, but you guys already know that most of our hypotheses are wrong. We test mm -hmm. them. We find out that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And True. this is one that tends to be wrong for most people about how it will go, how it will be perceived and how we'll feel. And many people 
those of us who tend to default to yes, because we're trying to preserve and nurture relationships, we're surprised at how empowering and great it feels to say no. I did no for a month when I got really, really overextended at the month of November. <laughs> and I told, I told people about it and it inspired a bunch of Facebook friends and other people to have this month of November, but you don't have to do a month and just try 24 hours. Yeah. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. So if someone asks you, you know, would, would you, uh, so in, in your case, you said you were overextended. So this, this is predominantly work and tasks you might not entirely want to do uh, type stuff. So if someone asks you, hey, would you mind helping me with this additional project? Your answer is no, or maybe no, thank you. I'd rather die and said enthusiastically. <laughs> um, but if it's someone, uh, if, if you're in a shop and someone asks you, do you want the receipt? I'm assuming if you actually want the receipt, this is not a mandatory no situation, right? Or is it? For the challenge? Thank you for asking. This was an important part. There may be all kinds of things that you practice saying no to, but you really wanted to or needed to say yes. So just practice saying no, have the experience of saying it, have the experience of their reaction, and then you can change your mind. And this is also good practice for all of us to reinforce. We always have permission to change our mind and other people too always have permission to change their mind. So even if you've made a commitment, even if they've made a commitment, we just need to create space for them, for us, for everyone to have permission to change their mind. Right. Yeah. I can't. I, this thing is, I'm a very social person. So if someone asks me like, hey, are you free tonight for a call? Then I'd have to say no. And then five minutes later, I'd be like, no, I am free. Actually, I would love to call. It just seems like it would be because I plan a lot of things really far in advance. So I feel like this would just be very inconvenient for me. I get where we're going with it, but I think for my social life, it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. As, as an exercise, though. As yeah. an exercise, it seems very fair. Hmm. And if you just practice saying no to this challenge, you're doing the challenge. There you right? go. Excellent. <laughs> Look at me getting an A+. <laughs> <laughs> I love so it. is 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 that step one? Because you said it was one of the first challenges you do in the class. Is that also one of the first things you, you lay down as a foundation in the book? Yeah. Or, okay. How do we flow from there? Because now assume that I have, in fact, mastered the art of saying no. Fat chance, but let's assume that I have. Let's assume. Let's assume. The next step is to practice rejection. Being so, rejected myself. Yes. Not, I can't deal with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So you want Nellis to go to a bar for... and try and pick pick people up? Is that, is that what's going on? I mean, yeah. I will have you know that my success rate at pick, picking people up any place is incredibly high. It's 100%. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh my yes. gosh. Never been refused. <laughs> what? <laughs> nope. Okay. That one person. It. Yeah. Nope. I believe it. Thank you. I believe it. <laughs> add, it add it to your CV. And the Absolutely. rejection challenge is just one big rejection challenge it's not that you have to do this for 24 hours and for anybody oh who, <laughs> for anybody who might want to try it as uh, the source of inspiration that we use for the class and I write about him in my book is Ja Jong's 100 days of rejection yeah. the video blog and there's the one of my favorite things on the internet is a video it's maybe five minutes long of it's day number three and he goes to a Krispy Kreme donut shop in Austin, Texas, and he asks them if they will make Olympic ring donuts for him. He, he just goes to all kinds of places and asks for all kinds of crazy things. And you have to look okay. to see why it's so, so, so adorable. Okay. And then we will make sure to link it down below. But so with these guys, so I, I think maybe I'm just interpreting some of these challenges completely wrong because I'm interpreting them on like a highly personal, almost exclusively social level. Whereas if someone at Krispy Kreme tells me, no, I will not make you a bloody God knows how big a size donut. I don't really see that as a rejection. I asked, they said, no, I move on with my life. But in your, in this uh, challenge specifically, do you want them to stay relatively unpersonal or maybe even superficial? Or have you had people who go really ham on this challenge so some students by the end of class are like oh professor you tricked us this whole class was a rejection challenge mm -hmm. so it gets bigger and bigger but the idea is that it's it follows the line of research on stress it follows the line of research on stress inoculation 
which is the Mm. idea that as you get exposed to small or minimal stressors, you're building resilience. Mm, So you practice getting rejected in small rejections so that you will have the resilience to withstand or the confidence to even try for rejection in something that you really care about. Like you, when you go and ask for a raise, most people don't even get rejected asking for a raise. First of all, most people don't get rejected when they ask for a raise. But second of all, the, the, the reason that most people don't get rejected by asking for a raise is that they don't ask for a raise mm. because they, it just doesn't feel comfortable. Doesn't occur to them. This is super uncomfortable. For, so we for reject ourselves before we, we reject get ourselves. rejected. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the fear of rejection is yeah. the barrier. Yeah. The fear of anticipating what that's going to feel like. Yeah. Um, puts you off trying. Yeah. Yeah. And this is another Aikido move with yourself because if you set out to get rejected, then a rejection is a success. So you're rewiring your mind. And when you teach yourself that the way that I'm going to build courage and resilience and confidence to become more influential is through a series of rejections, then you get rejected and it still hurts. I'm not going to say it doesn't, but there's mm-hmm. another part of you that's like, yes, I did it. And yes. it's it's also really important that we remind ourselves that if we're not getting rejected, what that means is we're playing small. Mm. We're just playing it safe and we're only putting ourselves out there to the degree that we know that we can succeed. And playing big requires stepping out of your comfort zone, asking and doing more than trying for things that are bigger than we think that we can achieve is the only way that we can actually play big. I think uh, there's something to be said about Mela's dating life in this. You just haven't been aiming <laughs> high enough, oh, Mela. That is such a burn. I would like I would like everyone to know that I'm in a very healthy, loving, successful relationship. But thanks, Sarah, for that comment. I'll let, I'll let Seb know how you feel about him. Yeah, send, send him my love. Send him my love. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm, I'm, I don't think you're going to get much love back. See? Good luck, Sarah. You've just participated in the rejection challenge. Sarah will reject your terrible comments. And it, it feels good. It feels good. I expect it. rejection. rejection. Yeah. <laughs> it's, fun. it's fun. Oh, my God. So, obviously, I'd be super happy to keep asking, so what's the next step? So what's the next step? But I feel like in that case, we're just spoiling the book. So we're not going to do that. You know, if you want to hear more about the steps that you can take to become more influential yourself, you're just going to have to buy the book. That is how this works. But I do. Yeah, yeah, you just have to. I mean, it's a great book, so I don't really see any issue with it. So a couple more questions about the book specifically without trying to spoil too much. I'm always very interested from a writer's perspective. Which chapter did you struggle most with writing and why? Oh, my gosh. Um. I definitely struggled with all of them. Oh, <laughs> but, and this took me five years and also a village of people helping me out. So I, this is very much my book and my life's work. But for mm-hmm. anyone who's thinking about writing a book, you might not have to do it yourself and you don't have to be able to do it yourself. And I had a writer working with me day to day in the trenches. I had a fabulous editor at Random House, but then I also hired another fabulous editor to work oh. with me in on the interim. And I had three research assistants. So wow. this- cool. Dear Lord. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was super fortunate to be able to get an advance that would allow me to hire more people to work with Mm. me like that. But many people go into the writing process with a collaborator and it's much more Mm. fun. I don't like working by myself on anything. So my life is a group project and, and this took five years. I also had an editorial coach even on the proposal and I got a ton of help from my two agents. So this is really, really, really a group. It's like, if you saw the credits for the book, it's more like the credits for a movie where it just goes on and on and on. You had a costume director? I need one. I need one. Um, But the- Well, it truly takes a village. (laughs) But the chapter that was the hardest out of all of them to me to write was the, the penultimate chapter where it 
recaps and reviews, but through mm -hmm. telling a story, all of the skills and ideas that I've been talking about in this amazing story about a former student of mine who changed the course of history and also had happened to become my husband in the process. Oh, I see. <laughs> so it was deeply personal. This, you know, this man that I adore most in the world. And I got to tell the story of him changing history and planning the first ever presidential debates in the Arab world. And it was a tumultuous process. It was very inspiring. It was also crazy making. And um, I, I was holding myself to such a high standard that I was going insane trying to write that one. Wow. Wow. Well, that has, I mean, I won't blame any reader who wants to skip directly to that chapter. Absolutely not. <laughs> I will skip to that chapter immediately. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> amazing. And congratulations on getting it written. Um, and they probably uh, could keep redrafting and keep redrafting, but at some point you have to let it go. Um, so yeah, did he read it already? Yeah, yeah, he's read it, and he's such a sweetie that he it, and he's one of those people who's gotten to the other side of influence where he's not really consciously using strategies, but he's a master at all of these. And Excellent. but but now mostly he's just being someone people want to say yes to, and he's putting great ideas out there and. And people are now coming to him and saying, hey, can we give you some money <laughs> for your I mean, great projects? In, wow. in all fairness, I think the best review of this is that he has become someone everyone wants to say yes to. You said yes to him because you got married. <laughs> I genuinely think when it comes to getting full circle and the student becoming the teacher or the master, <laughs> I don't think you could have a much better review for how skilled and able Zoe is at teaching you how to become <laughs> immense, immensely influential. So if that is not something to put on the cover and the jacket of the book as a sales pitch, I don't know what is. I mean, that, that to me is just perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mela and Sarah. You're such a pleasure to talk with. This conversation has just been immensely pleasurable for me. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm absolutely glad. I yes. mean, of course, everything we've mentioned so far will be linked below. But for us, always the final question is, is there somewhere that you would actually like to send to the listener? Maybe your own website, your social media, the direct link to purchase your book, you know, whatever you want to you want to send them to. We'll make sure to link it down below. But where do you want them to go? use your influence. <laughs> you can find all kinds of other stuff on my website, zoechance.com. Fantastic. Thank we'll you. make sure it's all linked below. I found you incredibly warm and competent. So <laughs> absolutely. Likewise. <laughs> absolute <laughs> double whammy. So congratulations and good luck for the rest of the book launch and whatever happens after this book. Um, yeah. Another book. Another book, another five <laughs> years. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. We've really enjoyed chatting with you today. Thank you so much. And good luck on your own influence journeys. And I would love to hear about them. So that was us talking to the absolutely brilliant Zoe Chance. I keep having the urge to say Chance because, you know, British <laughs> English, but no, Zoe Chance. And yeah, I'm just, I'm very much looking forward to this book coming out. You know, bit bit of a fourth wall breakthrough. We're recording this in January, but the book will be out from the 1st of February. So when this goes up, this book is out. So I strongly recommend that you go check it out and expand your influence because I think a lot of people can learn a lot from this. And apparently it starts at saying no. Yeah. Which, I mean, well, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you're right. Uh Honestly, it was it was really great to speak with Zoe. I felt that she was, you know, incredibly magnanimous, and mm. um, I learned so much in under an hour just through conversing with her. I can't imagine what five years worth of knowledge uh, mm. in book form looks like. So I'm definitely very excited to definitely. read the book when it comes out. Um, yeah, and if it sparked your interest, guys, definitely go and check out the book. Um, and who knows? Hopefully we'll hear more about Zoe and her work in the future because... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think powerful. that one is sitting still. No, no. no I'm, 
And that, I think that is, for me, one of the, the more interesting... I mean, everything was interesting, obviously. But one of the most interesting things that came out was that, you know, that the type of privilege that you have and how you're raised actually makes you a much better negotiator or maybe rather much more likely to negotiate and you can negotiate privilege and i think that's a really really interesting point yeah I yeah think it's, it's very very interesting it's a super interesting perspective and lens through which you know we can look through the world about mm. seeing privilege as a factor of influence and yeah. sort of understanding the different ways through which an individual gains mm. privilege it's it's all power really power yeah. and uh, influence go hand in hand Get a no. The Dutch have a saying about asking for things like, you know, if you don't ask, you already have a no. If mm-hmm. you do ask, you might get a yes. Yeah. Which obviously, statistically put, you know which option you should be choosing. So, uh, yeah, every, anyone listening, anyone who's maybe a bit more introverted or who's been told that you shouldn't ask and you should just own up to your own achievement and do it on your own, just ask. Yeah. Bloody ask. <laughs> Yeah, just just great stuff overall. I was I was super happy to be talking to Zoe. You know, as Sarah has already mentioned, uh, Zoe ranks incredibly high on both the warmth and competence ratings. Mm-hmm. So we are expecting for her to have much much more influence, and I'm sure this book will just hit like a meteor uh, or a meteorite. Rather, I just watched the film. Don't look up. So I've got oh, meteorites yes. on the brain. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Zoe's influence, I'm sure, will be ever expanding and I am super looking forward to it. So, guys, this in the, this outro is already uh, starting to become a bit longer than it normally is and we're not even remotely done yet. This is the season three finale of the Questioning Behavior podcast. And through us transitioning from, uh, you know, season one to season two, season two to three, we have indicated that normally we do take breaks because, you know, except for the podcast, we've got quite a an amount of other things going on in our lives next to the podcast obviously and between season three and season four if there is going to be a season four there will be a much longer break or hiatus if you will and we're just letting you know that to give you a heads up to uh, completely break down the fourth wall and give you some insight into our lives sarah is moving into the very last leg of her phd so like you know tensions are rising this shit is hard and As this episode goes up, I will have moved to Australia, where I have started my new job, uh, which is not as flexible as the PhD. So as a result, keeping up the podcast may pose some difficulties. So we thought we'd be transparent with you, you know, because we, we really appreciate all our listeners and the support that you've given us. And of course, the amazing people that we've interviewed. But we thought it would be nice if we were a bit more transparent about this. So there might be a season four, and if there is a season four, that will be not happening in the <laughs> spring of 2022. <laughs> Let us put it that way. So yeah, yeah um, obviously you can follow us on all the socials and we will keep those updated as well once we do know more about what our diaries look like. But that is all uh, for the sake of transparency. Yeah, no, we're entering a new transitionary stage in our Mm. lives. We started this podcast during a lockdown when we were Mm. both uh, over halfway through done with our PhDs. And Mm. um, yeah, if you're listening to this, we can't thank you enough for lending us your ears and your time. We've enjoyed making this podcast for you. We hope we will continue to make more. And yeah, just keep an eye out on social media. I'm sure we'll make a lot of fuss if we do decide <laughs> to make a fourth season. And if we do, we hope that it just continues the upward trajectory and we get to do more of this, which is what we love. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for sticking with us. Wish us luck as we enter this next stage. Please, thoughts and prayers, send them <laughs> to us. We need them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that's that's it from us for now, I guess. Guys, as always, we hope you thought this episode was entertaining, educational, thought-provoking, or at the bare minimum, at least somewhat interesting. And we hope you have a great week. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the one to love, you're the one I want to give to.